So welcome. I'm excited to share space with you in this way. Uh, we'll do some intros, but for context for the listeners and viewers, uh, we just came off of a three-day online uh, training uh, <laughs> that Shiloh and I co-facilitated and that Christine was one of the 32 participants of. And so we thought this would be a great opportunity uh, with a fresh perspective to debrief how it went and what this whole uh, online platform, Zoom or otherwise, could bring up for people and what are some creative ways, uh, both intrapersonally, interpersonally and organizationally, that we could sort of uplift certain procedures and practices to maintain a trauma-informed space for people. Uh, so welcome. Uh, Christine, do you want to uh, just get us started with uh, just giving any kind of introduction about yourself and what was the experience like for you? My name is Christine um, and I will be graduating from PSU's MSW program in next month actually. Um, and I have been a three-year exclusively online student which has helped um, my life at home um, very convenient um, and it enabled me or it enabled me to um, pursue my degree, still take care of my two girls at home and, and be there for them. So I work for DHS. I am the volunteer coordinator for District 2, which is Multnomah County, um, and we serve both child welfare and um, self-sufficiency. So. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how being a participant of the two and a half days was for you and uh, just begin yeah. to pull out anything that yeah, um, I'd love to. So I thought it was one of the most smoothest um, trainings that I have been. So I, that I've attended um, or meeting I've, in my three years, I have gotten to know Google Hangouts and Zoom very well. You know, when I first started school, a lot of people would tell me they would kind of like poo poo the online platform. Oh, that's not a real degree. That's not a real education, but it has allowed so much engagement. Um, I feel just as much as it would an on, on campus uh, program. Um, so that that myth that online trainings or education doesn't allow for interaction and engagement is not true. Um, not only did we get together for class uh, within the cohort um, and Zoom meetings that the instructor facilitated, but we got together outside of that big group um, and in our small little five group, uh, my five member group. And so that's what I got with this Zoom meeting. The breakout sessions, I love breakout sessions because that's where kind of like everything happens. We, that relationship building, that trust building, um, that's where it all happens and you come out feeling like you've gained more support um, and you come out knowing that you've got these people kind of in your um, on your side that you can reach out to right um, I thought the managing of um, conversations within the big group was handled very professionally um, and very respectfully um, and it was it's nice because we're, we were in this training from 8.30 to 4.30, and that's a long, long time. Um, and as much as we want to share and hear each other's story or what we have to say, um, there, you got to have some real skill to be able to kind of, um, for a lack of better words, cut someone off respectfully and, and maintain that um, the respect to the to everyone else's time um, in a training or a meeting so that went well um, the smooth transitions from the big group to the breakout sessions from the big group into the videos I think videos are tricky because you're always going to kind of run into something right and it's not necessarily our, our fault technology is great when it works the way you want it to right um, but there was some choppiness to the YouTube videos, but it wasn't so much to where we couldn't understand what was being said. So I think the only recommendation, if I can, yeah, um, the only recommendation I would look into is possibly making it half day trainings. Um, only because it is a long time to be in front of a computer and the, the information is so important. I mean, 
you could tell the passion. You, you, you felt that passion from every member through the screen. And we all wanted to be there and we were so eager to learn. And it was like, we were all sponges and we wanted to take it all in. And so I just wonder if we risk um, losing people when it's, you know, eight hours or whatever it is at a computer. So just, just a yeah. thought. Yeah, thanks for getting us started, Christine. Yeah. Shiloh. Come on in and tell us a little bit about yourself. And it was such a pleasure to co-facilitate with you. So um, it will be fun to debrief what worked. Hi, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I have my own consulting firm, uh, Thush Convex Dumbum Consulting, which means a great awakening of the heart and spirit in Chinook Wawa. And um, I think I went through the training cohort maybe three years ago, uh, this training and um, have been doing, you know, real trauma-informed practices for many years, um, being a social worker and working within um, nonprofits. Um, and, but taking the, the specific training through, um, through TIO has been really helpful. And um, I think I thought I knew a little bit more about trauma responses than I did when I, when I first took the training from you all, it was probably, it had to be like four years ago. And I was like, Oh, I have, there's a lot more here. <laughs> so it's been great to take the different trainings and the training of the trainer. And, um, most of the work that I do as a consultant and a trainer is, uh, trauma informed practices. Um, if I'm really lucky, I get to work with orgs who, uh, will allow me to do a, like a long series. So the training, um, the foundations training, uh, I kind of embed in uh, other types of trainings that I do. So, um, and I really try to look at the area of rapes and um, trauma and then also just justice um, and anti, you know, oppression and how do we do that work um, also with trauma-informed care as a vehicle for it. I think it works really well. So um, this is the first time that I uh, co-facilitated training of the trainer. And um, I was really excited uh, to work with you on it. Um, I think that it went really well. It was exhausting. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably exhausting to facilitate it um, anyways, like in person. And I, <laughs> you know, have seen you on, at the end of three days in the afternoon when there's usually like a, a professional development piece and you're just like you're still wonderful and beautiful but i could tell like it takes a lot out of you so um it is like a pretty intensive um i know that we had a lot of conversations ahead of time of you know how do we do this in uh, a zoom platform and and really give people lots of breaks so even though it was um you know eight hours there was a break typically every hour um and that still is exhausting for people. So um, yeah, I think that was really good to have those breaks. Uh, people were amazing. Uh, there was, you could see the connection happening mm -hmm. um, and it might've taken a little bit longer for that connection between people to happen. But I think Christine's right, those breakout sessions really help. I feel like people just really came into it with a really good attitude and were prepared um, and we're like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it online. It's going to be different than in person. Um, and we're just there for it. And um, yeah, so I think one of the things that was maybe a little bit difficult for me at the beginning, um, although I felt like I got better at it t towards the end was the chat um, space. Like I, um, found it really difficult to listen um, and or to talk like if I'm presenting and to watch the chat like I just couldn't do it so I had to tell everyone <laughs> um, and then I was like chatting and sending it to the wrong person and it it felt just really clunky in that way it was a little frustrating especially when like there was an elder who was wanting to talk and I was trying to be like you know acknowledge that I you know saw that her hand was raised but I was sending it to a private person who had just message me so that first day was, I was like oh um so yeah I think the chat the chat thing I think is something that needs to that we probably should talk about in this yeah um, yeah 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 so let's yeah. let's unpack that a little bit two things were brought up one is just the the fatigue of not just a full day training but let's just even say an hour-long meeting and the unique fatigue that's happening 
when when on screen and there are some articles that are coming out now around why that is and um, what are some tools that uh, we could put in place to give our literally our minds our eyes but also our spirits a, a bit of a break yeah. uh, and then talking about chat so in terms of the fatigue piece yeah offering as many breaks as possible uh, and i found that actually giving some instruction slash suggestion of how to use those breaks may be a way to sort of get ahead of the human tendency to like multitask during the break and stay on the screen in order to then check some emails or check the news but really instructing and really suggesting to people to you know move their bodies as feels good to them get some water maybe step outside or be outside for a minute so some way to um quite literally suggest to people what restoration looks like rather than just uh, a kind of numbing um, any other suggestions for alleviating that fatigue either interpersonally or intrapersonally that you've used for yourselves Anna, i thought those were great reminders um because i did find myself staying at the table and, and checking emails. And really we want to kind of move our brain, if you will, and, and wake it up a little bit to come back and, and be ready for the next topic. The suggestions were great. I think it's just a matter of making sure we do it, right? Yeah, yeah. And Shallow, I know when you and I spoke about this a while back, um, the you know suggestions to folks to turn on their cameras or not, maybe another way to give some choice around that level of fatigue, maybe not even, and just proactively speaking to, you don't have to look at the camera all the time. Your computer could be, you know, slightly off as a way to just literally give your um, eyes a, a bit of a rest. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts around how to manage that fatigue? I think um, making sure you're drinking enough water or tea or whatever it is that hydrates you, um, and, and again, uh, re I think the reminders are important um, because and to do it throughout the training um, because, or at the, the top of a, an hour long meeting and just letting people know and giving them that permission of like, you don't have to stare in the camera and, and all of that. I think uh, we know that information or at least we're starting to figure that out, but still having that um, permission is good, especially if it's a workspace um, and uh, you know, when I've done some training work very recently during this pandemic with some leadership at an organization, I was like, you know, make sure that you're being very, very clear and communicating often about your expectations. Um, because people may be assuming your expectations are similar to when to pre pandemic. Um, and so just being really clear with people and communicate, communicate, communicate. So I yeah. think that um, that works really well for especially workspaces. Yeah. And I think um, maybe notifying people ahead of time or, or letting them know, hey, set up your, your workspace, right? Bring those fidgets or those, those snacks that you guys so generously, though, that was amazing. That was like a oh, little surprise in the mail, the M&Ms and the popcorn. Like have what you need at your workspace so and and imagine that you are actually at that round table in a physical space right you got that basket of fidgets you got your snacks and you got your coloring pencils things like that so set it up to where you are comfortable um and are able to maybe stand up if you need to and still be online sit down if you want to um so just kind of it's, and, and that's on us as a participant, right? We can't expect you guys to do everything for us, but knowing what you need and having it there available for you. Nice, yeah. And then the, the power of the chat um, as one of the functions <laughs> of these online platforms. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that and we can even you know, scope it out even further around uh, just defining some of the features and putting some boundaries uh, around how they're used and how that's actually trauma informed uh, because certain needs will arise and where they're expressed is really up to what kind of culture we set up. So yeah, yeah the, the power of the chat box um, was, was interesting because it really was a whole nother world, a whole nother little subculture that could take off um, and that kind of fragmenting for the purposes of our particular uh, training and the cohort that we were trying to build was uh, counterproductive. 
And yet I could see how in certain meetings, uh, the chat box could uh, be useful in that way, that kind of quote unquote fragmenting. So I think uh, call, calling out slash naming what the purpose of the chat box is as early as possible um, so that there isn't a need to kind of redirect, but we're actually being transparent about it. Um, to, you know, to support connection, to ask questions, but that as facilitators, for example, we may not attend to every single question in a verbal way. Um, feels important because we likely won't. And if we do miss folks, uh, that might be experienced as quite um, uncomfortable and uh, alienating. And so as, as much as we can proactively speaking to you know, what, what factors of our human capacity may or may not be at play in the chat box. Um, any other thoughts about the chat box and just about transparency around facilitator roles and uh, what we will or will not do? Shiloh, first of all, I think you should give yourself a little more credit. Because <laughs> that's a beast of its own, right? Um, but I don't know, maybe having... Um, someone who has been through train the trainer manage it for you guys who is able who feels confident to um, redirect or um, answer questions and then if they can't you know jump into the big group and be like hey we have a question off to the side um, here it is what do you what are your thoughts so that because I can see how it can take your attention away um, from what you're talking about or what is being said um, and the way you guys co-facilitated was amazing. It was great having Shiloh jump in here and there and add her little nuggets of information. Um, and that, that was beautifully done. Um, but I think it takes away from the facilitator. So I would have someone kind of focus on the chat area alone just then, yeah. So I think just like um, being clear, like Anna said with, what what you how you want things to work with the chat uh, where you would like to get feedback um, and just being transparent about that piece is such a trauma informed practice that seems really small but um, having that clear communication going into it or if you're finding in the middle of a training or a meeting that there's an issue just naming it right then I think is super helpful for people yeah yeah and uh, you know part of the fatigue I think is also uh, has something to do with just the, the negotiating of different norms and different cues. Uh, you know, you're in a space and you used all your sp senses, including your spidey sense and who's who and what part of you is gonna show up, what the safety look like, who are the allies, even in the <laughs> most sort of um, subliminal uh, way of connecting with people. And now all of a sudden we're in this other space and I think part of the fatigue is trying to actually negotiate it all. And so I'm wondering if there's some useful ways or tricks of the trade, both as a participant, but also as a facilitator that we could um, name and kind of celebrate to, to actually give some power back, um, you know, to the participants that first of all, this is real. And second of all, here are some things we put in place to um, facilitate that connection. But for example, the just even the tool of uh, encouraging people to change their names to what they'd like to be called, yeah. inviting folks to include their pronouns if they wish. Um, I think that, again, in the name of trauma-informed care, we want to um, be inclusive and yet not require uh, that because that also has actually historically been a kind of um, gender-based oppression. Um, and so uh, even in the small group uh, prompts of sharing things about one another, um, maybe pinging some of those uh, ways of, oh, that's what you're about, okay, <laughs> um, yeah. so that we can set up a platform for people to connect. And in doing that, you gave us the power, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times our Zoom meetings or our, our trainings um, are very structural and this is what you need to do this is step a step b you know but you gave us power you gave us control um over what we could have control and power and that was very refreshing yeah i mean you know i'm a empathic person and i read the room when i do training and so 
I've been trying to figure out if that's possible by looking at people's faces. Like I can read a, sometimes a little bit from, from that, but it's just, it's kind of hard. And so I've been trying to get used to that. Um, I, um, I think that, you know, we use the chat a couple of times for questions, uh, prompt questions, and then people could add their answer to the chat. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure how that was really going to go in terms of creating um, community, but I, I personally thought that that was really helpful. Um, it was a way, cause you, there were so many people in the training, you couldn't really go around and have people do an introduction or, I mean, we kind of did a one at the, uh, the end of the first day where people said like a minute, but it can go on for two or three minutes. And then it was like 45 minutes. And I think all of us at the end of a long day, were just like, I want to hear this, but I'm also like so tired. Like I just want to get off the computer. So the next day, um, I think we split it, didn't we? Yeah. In half. And that, that was great. I think that worked a lot better. Yeah. Um, where Anna, you were in one room, I was in another. Um, but I think also using the chat function too was great where people could just put their answers in the chat and we could all read it. And there was still like kind of fun. It was really interesting also to see how similar, um, you know, multiple people had a similar uh, answer or I don't know, like it was just kind of fun. And mm -hmm. I didn't expect that I would feel connection with people or like, oh, you know, I didn't even think about that through a chat. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there are other things that are coming up for you that you wanted to share, but I think for a closing, it, it would be helpful to me to uh, bring this to the sort of organizational level uh, around um, what are some things that we want to consider uh, as we seek to be a trauma-informed organization or as we seek to maintain connection and some level of ritual during a pandemic. And so we are looking to use this platform. Um, you know, one thing, for example, that comes up for me is just being super uh, diligent about asking the question of, is it actually necessary? Yeah. <laughs> um, is it, is this a topic? Is this a platform that we need to use uh, in this way? Uh, for example, using a, you know, a Google shared document could be another way of incorporating people's voice and not having to be on video in real time. Um, so continuing organizationally to ask, is, that, is it actually necessary for us to meet via this platform um, and being honest about that? Uh, because the cost is, is actually potentially great. Uh, and so not making it the new normal slash the new way of meeting, but actually being diligent about asking, is it necessary? Um, are there any other sort of organizational or like organizational culture considerations that you want to bring in? Um, yeah, I have a couple of things actually. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, a, a little bit of kind of what kind of going a little bit with what you were just saying, Anna, I think also asking, is this a conversation we can have over the phone potentially, um, as opposed to a zoom or platform, you know, video chat. And so that's often I've been trying when I've been talking with clients and things like that is, can we have a phone call if I already have two zoom chats that day, you know, and I've noticed that people have been pretty flexible about that. Um, cause I just don't want to stare at a screen <laughs> anymore. Um, I think that, um, one thing uh, structurally, I, I, I do think that, that it's important to consider emotions and people's mental health with this. And I know I've had a couple conversations with people about staring at ourselves um, and uh, it bringing up like um, dysmorphia, body dysmorphia for people. So, um, you know, that's a thing to think about as well of, of what that can do to our mental health to see our faces all the time right in front of us. And it can be fascinating. It can also be really disturbing. Um, and so again, being very careful about allowing people to shut their cameras off. Um, that could be, and it's not like calling people out for that, but like just considering that there may be some other mental health, um, you know, situations going on with that. I did want to bring up the affinity space because I think mm. that's unique. Um, to this training, I bring it to a lot of the trainings that I do. Um, and I think it's a, a really, you know, beautiful, supportive piece, especially doing this training. And so uh, we had a BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color affinity space that was scheduled at the end, the last day. 
And um, I have co-facilitated that with Charlie, and then you co-facilitated the um, affinity space for white folks. And we had two different agendas um, for that. Um, but, and then, you know, I really, Anna, I thought you did a really great job acknowledging, like, there's lots of different affinity spaces we could have around identities, and yet we're going to focus on race. Um, and really trying to help people understand why we're focusing on race first, right, and, and doing that, I think, was, was really helpful. Um, I think it's always really amazing to hear feedback from those affinity spaces. Um, I obviously am going to keep confidential what was said in that space, but there was a couple pieces of feedback that I wanted to share that I thought was really great. Um, one of them was to have affinity space throughout the training. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, uh, when you have breakout rooms um, to kind of go over how the session was for you to make those affinity spaces for BIPOC folks. Um, to get to meet each other a little bit quicker and have that supportive space throughout the training. Um, and it is a, a really, really supportive space for most BIPOC people. I've never heard someone be like, I don't like this. Um, it could happen, but I've never heard it. Um, and I think just considering when you're talking about topics that involve um, race or any kind of structural dynamics that uh, you think people need to kind of be separated to have certain conversations. Maybe it's between online or frontline staff and management, right? There's times that I've split up those power dynamics in conversations and it's really helped whatever we're trying to discuss. Um, and it also helps me as the trainer get an idea of maybe potentially what's going on in a space where people feel like they can't talk. They can talk in that affinity space. Um, as far as um, organizations doing affinity spaces, there can it can be kind of fraught, um, especially if we're talking around race. Like if I'm just being really blunt, like white folks can often have a really hard time with affinity space and not understanding why people are being separated. Why are, why are they not allowed to hear that conversation? Um, I think there can be a, um, kind of a misnomer that like, um, that it's, it's a bad thing that, that mm -hmm. Black, Indigenous, and people of color have their own space. Um, and that it's kind of like we're going backwards in terms of, of looking at race and um, those dynamics. So I think being very clear, and there's articles about out there about affinity spaces. So if you're wanting to do that in your org, there's some great articles. You can always, I think, contact us. Um, I will tell you that um, one of my clients is a large government organization. And when... I started this training series. There was one training that I wanted um, to be BIPOC only. So we had um, two different sessions, one for anybody and then one for BIPOC only um, folks. And um, at first the um, organization said no, because it goes against we're title one agency and it goes against mm -hmm. our non-discriminatory non-discriminatory policy and what they ended up doing is making it an ERG session so an employee resource group session um, and that worked out great because they already had the wording for that it was already an institutional practice and it was fine um, so just if you're out there and you maybe want to do an affinity space and you're not sure how to make that happen those are some ways to sort of get around like title one um, requirements and things like that because those affinity spaces are really important and you can see when we're trying to do trauma-informed practices or uh you know uh racial justice practices how our policies that are supposed to protect people can actually kind of create barriers to doing moving the work forward so there are always usually workarounds you just have to be super creative yeah. i like the suggestion of having the affinity group throughout the training. I think um, not only because, and you can tell I'm such a relational person, not only because it builds that relationship, but we talked about how fatigued we are at the end of the training and we just want to get off the computer. So starting that connection earlier and having it throughout is great. Um, I'm also, I appreciate the fact, Shiloh, that you brought up ERG because although I never heard the term affinity space, I have heard ERG and I didn't know that they were the same. Um, and it's unfortunate that, you know, the white community may feel whether it's left out or that there's a separation, because honestly, I really look at it as 
gathering with people of like mind or of your same culture, right? My Middle Eastern family, we could get together and we could throw jokes or talk about a situation and we understand each other. Um, whether, and that's different than if I were to get together with, um, you know, other friends of mine of other races that wouldn't understand the story of being a refugee or, you know, that struggle or, you know, the jokes that we make that only my family would understand. So thanks. Uh, it's just, I wish there was a little more um, understanding around why we get together with, with our people, if you will, and how it's beneficial to each race and ethnicity. Yeah, yeah thank you both for, for that. And Thanks for bringing in all that that feedback as well. Uh, it seems like, you know, one of the ways to go about this is to use the the six principles as we're considering uh, whether or not to use an online platform to gather, and then if we use it, how we could uh, inform some of the practices through safety, through trustworthiness and transparency through peer support and mutual self-help and how we support that and collaboration and mutuality and um, voice and choice uh, are super important at this time, yeah. especially when we feel like this is the only way to meet and I'm actually yeah. not being offered a choice around how to show up because, you know, in a physical space, I can actually, you know, take off and rearrange my living room in my mind and you wouldn't know it <laughs> um, but on zoom it may be a little more obvious as my face kind of uh, goes blank <laughs> and then most importantly really the the sixth principle um, under SAMHSA's substance abuse and mental health services administrations is the cultural historical and gender considerations which is really a sort of ironic catch-all as Shiloh and I like to laugh about. Um, and ultimately that's the, that's the work of inclusion and accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we didn't touch too much on the importance of accessibility at a time like this where, you know, captions are not actually Zoom's uh, immediate way of doing business. Uh, they're actually secondary things you have to do in order to even get a transcript of the meeting. Um, but mm -hmm. even just the physical accessibility, the online accessibility, not all of us have. Uh, particular kinds of uh, online resource in order to have this meeting be yeah. available to us. So that sixth yeah. principle feels uh, especially important um, if we should continue to meet over Zoom. So thank you. Thank you both so much. And um, thanks for debriefing this for uh, the benefit and hopefully um, learning of everybody. Thank you.